Well, good morning and welcome to another episode of Unpublic with Citizen Stewart. Today, my guest is Miss Jasmine Lane, an educator here in Minnesota who's going to stay permanently in the state of Minnesota and never leave and never leave her position or post to go anywhere ever um, besides Minnesota. Um, good morning, Jasmine Lane. How are you doing? Morning, Chris. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Is that an accurate setup for you? Uh, you know, that you're never going to leave us in a million I years. I don't know about the never. <laughs> I don't know about the never. <laughs> yeah. We should never say never. Uh, Minnesota might lose me given uh, the way that things continue to trend the wrong direction in my mind. We do a very good job in Minnesota of talking the talk without walking the walk. We have the world's best kind of marketing on the standard of living and quality of life and the world's worst fact checking on how that standard of living and quality of life actually work for people of color. Um, and no place is that more evident than in education. Within education, uh, we boast some of the world's uh, best schools. We pat ourselves on the back for how great education is for the kids of Minnesota. And oftentimes when we're doing this boasting and bragging, I shouldn't say we, but when some Minnesotans do this bragging and boasting from a very high level about how great we are, one of the things that they often do is they say, you know, but, you know, but, you know, but. So this yep. is what the you know, but is. I mean, we're the greatest place in the world. We have great schools. We have, you know, some of the best educators in the world. We're amazing. But, 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 you know, but. For, you know, Latinx kids, black kids, uh, kids of color in general, Native American citizens, do. we got some work to do. Yeah, yeah, we got some work to do, you know, got some work to do. Um, um, yeah, we got more than some work to do. We are abysmal. We are, two, we are a tale of two states. And the Twin Cities are a tale of two cities. Night and day in the performance. And, and when I say performance, the outcomes for people of color, uh, especially in schools, I locate the problem in the system not being serious about pedagogy and the, the mechanics of schooling, the things that you can do actually to know that you're using science and matching that to the needs of kids and improving your systems over time. And what we are is we are a lover of fads. Um, the Twin Cities, what I've seen over time is the two Twin Cities love them some fads. Boy, they vote them in left and right. Uh, um, every two years, every one, two, three years, new reading program, new kind of curriculum structure, um, new ways of seeing the world, never based on anything. Just seems weird to me. So that's my setup, Jasmine Lane. I do want to talk to you about something more than that, too. I do um, want to talk to you about uh, the canon, the classics, teaching current events in the classroom, and this moment that we're in where both Woke people and anti-woke people are getting on my nerves. And yes. I have a sense that you're in a similar place. <laughs> and that's really what I want to talk about, too, is get to is where is there a place for us who get annoyed by the woke and the unwoke uh, folks? Um, and don't let me put words in your mouth. Let me just ask you, check with you. Is that where you're at, too, right now? Yes. The, I mean, we're, we're just going to call them, I think last time I talked to you, we called them the overwokes. Like, yes, overwokes. I can't, I can't take them. Um, and then like, I'm anti, I'm anti, anti-woke, but also <laughs> I'm not pro-woke. Right, so right. Somewhere in between that. <laughs> yeah, because they both get on my nerves right now and I wish they like, would go away. Do y'all think? That's what yeah. it's just like, do you, do you, do you hear what you are saying? Yeah. You're saying that it's racist to teach kids to use a different set of grammar. <laughs> we're just yeah. we're gonna, we we just not gonna teach. We just not gonna teach them. That's just that's what they're saying. I'm just like, no. Well, just, and you know, it's it's racist to expect them to do better because of where they come from and who they are. It's ex, it's racist to not just concentrate and focus on things outside of the classroom, but to also focus on inside the classroom. My one that's really getting on my nerves a lot that not, you know, listen, people on all sides of the fence disagree with me on this. It's really just this standardized testing is 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 the problem. It's not a a barometer. It is the actual problem. It is actually racist to test kids um, and, and standardized testing is rooted in racism and all these other things. And uh, I just hate that we get lost in the wrong talking points sometimes yeah. because I want to know how kids are doing. I want to know how my kids are specifically doing. Last Saturday, dropped them off to do their MCAs, which are our state test for those who are listening and watching. This Saturday, we have to drop them off for the second part of that. It took them an hour. 
right, to do the reading portion. It's going to take them an hour to do the math portion. And that is an hour well served to me for the information that's going to give us back in a month or so. Uh, actually, the the results come back pretty quick, so it's even faster than that. So um, I'm not here for everything is racist. You know, listening to people say everything is is racist. Um, but then again, I'm not here for the people who say nothing is racist. Yep. <laughs> Just like, you yeah, know? no, there's definitely systemic racism. Yeah, but like the standardized test isn't it. <laughs> no, no, standardized test isn't it. And you know, the idea that teachers might introduce some things into the classroom that make some people uncomfortable isn't the worst offense that has happened uh, ever either. Um, and I think that's what the anti-woke people are saying is like, oh my God, I'm being, you know, um, our kids are being bombarded with the idea that racism exists uh, in the world. And it's kind of like, yeah, okay. All right. Well, this is why I'm for school choice. So, Jasmine, this is why I'm for school choice, because I don't think we're all supposed to be in the same schools. I say it all the time. People get mad at me for saying it. But I want to share my screen just quickly with this article that kind of got me thinking day before yesterday that I bumped into your Twitter thread um, that you were talking a little bit about. Um, uh, we had this big verdict here in the Twin Cities, you know, with the George Floyd case. I talked about it twice, two or three times this week. And you know, there was this question about what teachers should do about it. Like, it's a big major event. It's upsetting um, um, the balance, of, the normal balance of life in Minnesota. You can't just go about your business and not recognize you have, you know, the military here and had police officers everywhere and kids are like, you know, living in kind of like encampments. Mm -hmm. um, so there was arguments online about um, should teachers be talking about Black Lives Matter, police violence, racism, the George Floyd case, in uh, in class, and I noticed that you had a tweet where um, your take on it was really that this is not something that you would allow to interrupt, like the normal flow of what you were your lesson plans and what you were doing, but you would make room for people to have these conversations outside of class. Um, so tell me more about like because because <laughs> you know you said a trigger word in that tweet. You, you said uh, I'm going to keep teaching Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know is my I, just, trigger I, word. I intentionally said Macbeth versus another book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you trolled me on that one. You was trolling. I was like, wait a second. We can't talk about George Floyd, but we're going to talk about Macbeth. <laughs> you know, I hate me some Shakespeare. Um, um, so tell me about your, like, what you were seeing with the kids in your classroom. What leads you to, to think that it's not actually for everybody to bring these, these issues into the classroom? Um, well, one thing is I'm thinking about myself, like my ability to process through it. Um, like I can't like intellectualize it and like not get emotional about it. Like it's a pretty important topic to me. Um, so that's one part for me is like me knowing like, can I be the like leading adult teacher in a professional manner? Like if somebody mm -hmm. says something mm -hmm. stupid that I think is stupid, <laughs> am I going yeah. to be able, you know what I mean? And so yeah. that's one part. But then also, there are kids in that classroom that might say something really wrong and it's gonna fire up some things. And mm, so that's, it's about protecting the kids who are triggered by this, who maybe have trauma in their families regarding it and making sure that they don't have to feel, they don't have to sit there and listen to that like targeted bile is basically what I'm gonna call it. Um, mm -hmm. And just knowing, and the fact that we were online all school year, and we had, had, if I was still teaching at that school, I would have only been in person with them five times by the time this happened. I don't trust the, I don't trust the um, classroom culture to be able to sustain that. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's like at the beginning of the year or when things happen, it's not like I'm saying like, um, it's not allowed in this classroom. Like that's not how I'm framing it, but it really mm -hmm. is like, if you need to talk about this, I want you to be able to say what you need to say without feeling like you're gonna have to defend your right to exist. Mm. And so in order to do that, I have to make sure that the people that are there um, are there with, I'm not gonna say the right way, but they're with the right heart. Um, Cause there might be there, who knows? There could have been a kid that said like, well, maybe if he just hadn't resisted arrest, like I'm not gonna suscept um, my kids to that. Um, or myself. <laughs> so, and, and tell me about your classroom. Is it a mixed classroom in terms of the the makeup of students? 
Yeah. Um, so it, I mean, I'm not going to name the school, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so I, I no longer work there just because of some, a lot of issues, but yeah. um, targeted racism from students and parents. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> it I was, it was, that's what schools it is then. It was, a, it was a, it was a rough year, yeah. Um, yeah. but it was, it's like an inner city tier one suburb, lots of black kids, lots of, yeah. you know, special ed, English is additional language, but also like, you know, a, maybe 20, 15, 20% of, you know, working class white people. Um, mm, and so mm -hmm, those, mm -hmm. you know, that I got a lot of like, you're being politically biased for teaching like the ain't I a woman speech. And I'm like, you understand this speech is just saying that black people deserve equal rights, right? Mm, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but like, yeah, it's politically biased. Like that's, that's the environment that I was teaching in. Um, so I'm not gonna wow. make my kids, my, I wanna say my kids, I mean my, my black students, I'm not gonna make them have to, have to work participate. around that. Wow, okay, so now that's interesting and that's not a take that I would have been considering as I was thinking about this this week, is we do have teachers that are on, under fire for any little thing that they teach. I mean, I've seen some things online um, with parents getting online because they're hearing their kids what their kids are teaching. Mm -hmm. And the moment that they hear anything about Black Lives Matter or anything like that, they get triggered. And in a couple of cases have actually right in front of all the other kids on Zoom challenged the teacher, you know, on some of these things. So, yeah, then and we have more of a surveillance environment, I think, on teachers now. Yeah. Parents are watching. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine with yeah. people tuning in. It's not like I'm saying like like my personal feelings about how I feel about the police or about like current events, I don't explicitly say like, this is the right way to think about them. And I really, I rarely explicitly say, this is how I feel anyway, but just the yeah. fact that I mention it and the fact that I'm the only black teacher ever in this department really triggered some of the white parents. Um, yeah. And it's just like, you're, you're, you're a black teacher and you're talking about black issues and you're reading a book by a black person. Oh my God. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you understand what fences is about, right? Like it's not about white people <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, see Jasmine, I'm going to need you as a teacher for a year or so. Cause I think all of this is boring just to be very honest with you. You just mentioned <laughs> fences. I can't think of a more boring play, but anyways, <laughs> keep going. See, I'm going to get all kinds of hate mail. I just, listen, anybody listening to this watching right now, Jasmine's the educated one on this, on today's broadcast. And uh, I'm the Neanderthal because I think so much is boring. I actually tweeted, I subtweeted you the other day. I subtweeted you saying, um, uh, the movie is always better than the book just to see if I would, I would bait you in. You didn't take the bait though. You didn't see it. It's that's uh. false. <laughs> Honestly, Chris, I don't think you like literature. I do, but I like, are this you is, sure? Okay, well, this is okay. Let's talk about this then, because this is part of the title of the show today. So, um, so I called this show that we're talking about right now, the classics, no, the Canon, the classics and current events in classrooms. Mm -hmm. So what we have just been talking about are current events making it into classrooms. So um, so how do we use, we know the fact that, the li that life is upset for, uh, the balance of life is upset in Minneapolis for many kids because they're seeing the military and others in their area. They're, they know that there has been a murder again. This isn't the first one. Th these things keep going on and on. They know that they live in a city where their immediate surroundings are different than if they just go two miles away like in the same city, right? So how do you take all of that and create a classroom where that is becoming some of the mainstay of the learning and the education? But there's all this conversation and you're involved in a lot of these conversations online between these camps. I never knew about this war, but there's this, the, this disrupted text camp and then there's this Canon Classics camp, right? Now, I love you and have a lot of respect for what you do and listen to you and read you and, and consider you to be like kind of an expert and a guide on some of these things. And then, but I always fall in that other camp, the disrupted text camp, like, because mm -hmm. I don't get the Canon and who's made up and who's usually in that Canon to mm -hmm. me just doesn't make sense for my kids of color. It just does not make sense to me that we would put so much importance and weight uh, into people's, it's almost like reading other people's email for a living. Like mm -hmm. I don't really get it. So help me understand like, um, like maybe I don't like literature, but I definitely don't like dry, old, tired literature. Uh, um, but, but you're not in the disrupted text camp. You are definitely in the classics camp and, and help me understand that. Like what's to you, what's, what's rich about that? Um, well, one, I guess like, I'm not, 
like the idea of like disrupting a text, I just feel like it's kind of like, if you're a good English teacher, you're talking about those things anyway, because that um, that's just part of your subject knowledge. Like, I don't know, like, are you saying that when you talk about of mice and men, you're not talking about the N word, you're not talking about like income inequality. Um, so it's like, the, if you know your subject, you don't need to do that. But then also I just think that they say some stupid things like Shakespeare has no more literary merit than anyone else. Like, I just think that's dumb um, because some stuff is better than others. And people call me an elitist for that. And I'm like, I guess you can say that, but not everything is equal quality. Um, it's, it's just not. Um, yeah. Do you so think that, for instance, do you think, though, that Shakespeare is better than James Baldwin? The funny thing about that is James Baldwin was actually heavily influenced by Shakespeare. No, but that's not my point, because I saw so, I read something yesterday written about uh, by Cornell West, where he's like defending the classics because Howard University is about to drop them. And he's he's defending them. I've never seen anything like it. He's he's written this big defense. And he was saying that Martin Luther King was influenced by the classics. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and he named a couple other very prominent uh, civil rights people. And I, I thought, yeah, but mm -hmm. I'm not Martin Luther King in his time. Actually, he was living in a dearth of black literature. I'm living in, in an abundance of black literature. So I get to read his, like the Testament of Hope, uh, mm -hmm. which is all of his writings, uh, to me to, seems more interesting and profound than, than Shakespeare. So, so is it a thing about like as time goes on, some of these things become more or less relevant? Or, I mean, it depends. Mm -hmm. So it's so I'll go back to your question. It's not. I don't even know if I can compare James Baldwin and Shakespeare because they're both canonical authors because they're both amazing at what they do. Um, yeah. Shakespeare wrote yeah, plays. Yeah. Shake, um, James Baldwin didn't. Um, so it's difficult to compare that way, and that's not really the point because they're both. You know, we can say like which one is better, but they're both like excellent and they're both in you know the canon um but in terms of like relevance it also what is like your thematic arc for the year like if you're talking about like the power in the individual you know what i mean mm -hmm, there's lots of mm -hmm, text that mm -hmm. can speak to that and when you think of it in that thematic arc which a lot mm -hmm. of teachers don't that's how you make something relevant and you don't like my thing is like you don't have to like any of the books that we go through you can disagree with every single thing but like mm -hmm, that's the mm -hmm. fun like, I would love to have you in my class because you'd just be like, this is so, like, hey, you're trying to tell me this is important because blah, blah. And then, like, the other kids would come at you because, like, that's the fun is having yeah. stuff where not everyone's just going to be like, this is the most important thing I've ever read. I don't think of it that way at all. Um, yeah. I will say this much, uh, Jasmine. There wasn't a single teacher that enjoyed having me in their classroom. <laughs> <laughs> In years of trying, uh, that was never the case, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and and I, I should say, and because it was worse then than it is now in terms of teachers really not thinking that they had to include culturally relevant things, you know, in, in my schooling years. Yeah. It wasn't like it is now where there's so much emphasis on it, like there's so mm -hmm. many people thinking about it. I see some people in the comments that are like, like nobody agrees with me on this. I get it. I, I, you know, I, and the bard, you know, like, um, don't hate the bard. And and uh, and Robert Enlow in here is like, can't we do both? And I think by can't we do both, he's meaning, can't we do some? Uh, can't we do James Baldwin and and the you bard? should so, a good curriculum yeah. is representative of the canon and time, space, gender, whatever. Um, yeah. And that's another issue because I just how many teachers have a degree in their subject versus like mm. a degree in teaching that makes a difference if you've taken four literature classes versus yeah. you have a degree um so like my understanding of the canon as i've written and as i've talked it's not like only people from like homer and you know the iliad and things like that like it's dead not, white guys what we've all said is dead white guys it's yeah not it's that not to that you. at all yeah. because yeah the canon is it's growing it's continuing to be it just if you want to be in the canon write something really well and like of course okay i've seen you say this um but do you really think that other people when they say the canon that they, that they share your expansive kind of idea of what could be in the canon like what people is that canonical? Know literature do yeah you think so you think mm -hmm. that they have a diverse understanding that uh that what's what goes into the canon is more than the dead white guy stuff yeah 
I mean, yeah. and the, like it, it also depends what your degree emphasized. So it's, it's not like only what I studied is what the canon is, but it's like, if that's what you studied and you don't continue to develop your knowledge, then you're just kind of missing out. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. like, there's things that I don't know. Like I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, you know, my knowledge of British literature is actually pretty light, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a canon of British literature. I know a mm -hmm. lot about American literature, lots of canon in there. So I'm, you know what I mean? And it's, like the canon isn't just four dudes from 3000 years ago. It mm -hmm, continues, mm -hmm. people continue to be added. People continue to be, you know, things that get studied. Um, the idea of a canon is just like, these are things that are worth spending time and studying. Um, and there's a lot of literature that's not, and that's fine because not everything is meant to be studied. Sometimes it's just meant to be consumed. Um, yeah, well, I know you have an opinion about, so I'm, let me get to this thing about um, more contemporary writers and because and, mm -hmm. and you have a you have an idea or an opinion about uh, YA like young adult um, <laughs> literature see there go the eyes rolling so b before we get there when you and I talk about how woke and anti-woke people are putting us in a bind right now because they are so going so far into what it is that they believe the anti-woke people to me are defending a Eurocentric um, norm and they are fighting anything that breaks away from that. So that's where they, they, you know, they're, they're forcing all these weird things on us and telling us that, you know, you know, Plato and Homer and all of that can no longer be the norm, the standard. They're, they're wanting to take down our Confederate, um, monuments. They're mm -hmm. wanting to take, you know, George Washington off of a, a school name and off of the dollar. And they're wanting to replace it with Harriet Tubman and all this weird stuff. And blah, blah. so they are, involved in what I consider to be Anglophilia. And that mm -hmm. really is my main problem with the canon and the classics. Those people drive me nuts stuff. because they they just make us look bad. I'm like, I'm like no one even no one even talks about Plato in high school, first of all. And you probably <laughs> didn't even read Plato in college if right. you went to college. <laughs> like let's be honest. Yeah. Um and so like that's a misrepresentation. But then the other side where it's just like anything goes, anything is quality. I'm like no, it's not. Yeah. I tried to read a young adult book uh, last week and I I gave it 150 pages and I just couldn't do it anymore. I'm like, this is so poorly written. I'm like, mm. there's just nothing here. I'm like, kids might like it and that's about it. And like, people are just like, this is yeah. the best thing ever. And I'm like, I think you're just saying that because it's someone that's not white. And that's what, something what, that um, also bothers me. Would a book like The Hate You Give fall into that category? Mm, I haven't read The Hate You Give for a couple of years. Um, when I read it, I remember thinking, I'm like, oh my God, this girl kind of sounds like me when I talk. Um, or when I, <laughs> when I was growing up, like, I'm like, that's yeah. how I talked when I grew up. Um, and then like, she like goes to a school with my kids or whatever. And so like in that way, like I definitely see kids liking it. Um, but like, I can't, can't recall like the literary quality of it, but I remember um, yeah. it's, it's also not very rigorous. Like it's not meant to be, it's a young adult book. Um, it's like written at a pretty low grade level. Um, so that's my, also, also my concern is that, um, you know, people will put, put out something like they'll pull out something more rigorous, even if it is by author, that's not white. Um, and they'll do that instead because it's easier. And so that's, you know, that, that also comes into play for me mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. like, if you want to teach not white authors, there's lots of canon, like well-written, high quality, like important literature, like of black people that you can mm -hmm. pull on. Um, it doesn't have to be this book that's not very good and came out 20 seconds ago. Um, do you have like stuff that you think like is more, so when you say that, do, are you talking about things that are like, you know, um, Zora Neale Hurston yes. and Audrey Lord and stuff mm -hmm. that's older, but do you find that there's any contemporary up to date, like coming out right now stuff um, that fits that category too? I actually don't read a lot of contemporary literature just because I feel like a lot of it, like a lot of literature that's written isn't very good. It's just mm -hmm. like, it just is what it is. So I kind of rely on my friends um, who read more contemporary literature to do that. But um, I just read like The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, and like that is going to be canon. Like it's, mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. anybody who understands literature, you're going to be teaching that like in your classrooms. Um, like it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, so like that's a so, new book. Uh, Tanji and see Tanji, I'm getting your written, your name right, uh, today. Um, Tanji says, um, 
there's a limited there's very limited knowledge base about the literary canon simply because there's a lack of knowledge about the meaning of the word canon itself um so i know what i'm thinking when i think about um the canon and canonical thinking i'm thinking of you know moses coming down from the mountain and saying <laughs> these are the 10 commandments right these are the this is the ones we picked them there were a hundred and now there are 10 commandments out of the 100 mm. and we selected them in some way because they have value or merit um, yeah. but i actually don't believe that even people who understand the word canon or canonical thinking actually believe in the same like like i'll give you a for instance in reading diane ravitch's book uh the death and life of the american public school um, I think that's the title. Of, you know, I might be butchering it a little bit. She gives towards the end what she thinks should be a canon a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And and the black people on that list, I I believe, are Martin Luther King and um and uh, Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass, yeah. And then the rest are like Thoreau and Shakespeare and you know, like all these like dead white guys. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so you have in this book. Uh, Diane Ravitch just talked about how you went to this idyllic Houston public school that was all white and and um, and and segregated, and the teachers were grading arbitrarily, but they owned the classroom and blah blah. Mm -hmm. That's your version of the school, and of course, this would be your canon. But this is where the disrupt text uh, comes in for me. I don't want my kid learning the way that Diane Ravitch learned. Mm -hmm. Right, and I don't want them learning that everybody who ever said anything poetic was white. I don't want every, them thinking that the most important things, like I don't want them thinking that uh, I'm writing something right now today, where I basically make the point that there has been 108 billion people that have lived on planet Earth and walked the Earth. Why would we teach that the most important things came out of a very small subset of that, rather than teaching global history, world mm -hmm. history, world literature, right? There are, there are kids in American classrooms who are never going to be introduced to African literature, to some of the best Asian texts uh, of history or whatnot. And if you give me kid A, who gets what we call the canon in, the, in Western world, versus kid B, who gets the sum total of all human knowledge, mm -hmm. I'm going to go for kid B. Right? I'm kid B. Okay. Well, I hope you understand mm -hmm. when you say canon then. Um, it doesn't just mean America. To Tangie's point, just to Tangie's mean, point, you yeah. know, to Tangie's point, she thinks most people don't understand what we mean when we say that word. What is like your definition of what that word means? Canon just, so it's not the canon. It's not just one that no one else comes into. Um, every culture, every time period has their stuff. And it's just like, if we were going to look at this time period or, you know, this history of whatever, this is the thing, these are the things that people have decided um, or, you know, whatever, that this is the stuff that's, we want to keep that kind of says something important about it. And so I, I wrote about this when I'm like, okay, think about literature, you guys. Like if you're talking about black feminism, there's a canon of black feminist literature. If you're talking about Russian literature, there's a, like some canonical text for, for Russian literature. So every mm -hmm. whatever has their own thing. Um, and so it's not just like, like even like American literature, it's not just like, if you say that American, the American canon is just white people, you're just, that's just dumb. Um, Cause it just shows that you just don't know. Um, I mean, I shouldn't be calling people dumb. Oh, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's what it is. It's like every yeah. single, whatever you want to look at post-colonial literature has things that like, these are kind of the key things that you need to build like a, a base level of knowledge. Um, and that's, that's what I'm getting at. And so for me, when I'm, when I'm planning literature, again, it's the thematic arcs, but because I've studied all these different countries, I've studied post-colonial colonial literature. I mm. took like three black feminist classes. Like I have all of that stuff. So when I'm planning, I'm not just like, okay, well, I read this in high school. I guess I'll teach it too. Like I have that stuff in my head too. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm, I'm putting so much emphasis on teachers needing to read. I'm like, the stuff is there. You just have to read it. Like you don't have to go to this, low quality thing um, that's like easier to teach and you don't have to actually teach kids how to read it. They can just read it because it's written at a third grade level. Um, a lot of YA is it's written at a low grade level and I don't like that, especially with high school. Um, you, you kind of feel like it's dumbing down what kids are capable of reading and what they're capable of understanding. Yes, in the classroom is different mm -hmm. than like independent reading. You can read whatever you want for independent reading. I have, it's, I have no judgment about that, but in the literature classroom, 
Mm -hmm. should be teaching things that they wouldn't see on their own and that without a teacher to teach them, they probably wouldn't be able to get it because that's the point of me. It's not mm -hmm. a book club. Mm -hmm. I'm not a librarian. Like I'm there to teach stuff. Um, and so that's also something that I've, I feel is getting missed because the classrooms that I've been in where they're using YA or they're using Reader's Workshop, it's sit here and read this book for 45 minutes and then I'll have you share with your partner for five minutes at the end. Mm -hmm. Multiple mm -hmm. classrooms where I've seen that. Or it's like, um, we're gonna do two choice books and then at the end, you're gonna do a 30 question multiple choice for your summative assessment. That's mm. what's being done with the disrupt text under the disrupt text thing. And because of our moment, which is important, and because it's most of those young adult books are by not white people, like you mm -hmm. can't really criticize it because then it's like, oh, you're just saying that because the author is black. It's like, no, I'm not. There's stuff that's to a better purpose. Like, I, what am I supposed to do with a book that they can fully access on their own? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'm, what am, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not a babysitter. I, okay. Well, I, let me mm -hmm. give this example. So, mm -hmm. well, first of all, let me back up and just say the first book that I ever read cover to cover and like got all of the meaning out of the story and soaked all of the meaning out um, uh, was, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very weird um, fact about Chris Stewart. Now, at the time that I read that book cover to cover and um, and and got every piece of meaning out of it and so felt what the, the young girl was experiencing in that book, it was just so weird. It was like I knew her. Um, at that same time, we were studying something in school that I can't remember. Like some one author or another that mm -hmm. back in my time was mandatory that we did. And I, I wasn't reading anything cover to cover. I was skimming things because I was bored with them and the content was uh, not lively at all. And then the teaching wasn't very good. You know, the mm -hmm. teaching of it was just like either you get it or you don't or either wrong. you're with me or don't. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I get paid whether you learn or not. Yep. This is just going to be what it's going to be. We're just going to mm -hmm. do this for an hour. And if you don't like it, you just don't like it. And I don't have any obligation to do anything but lecture at you about it. And as a kid, I picked up on, oh, okay, see, that's not for me. Yep. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's about you and your people and about your stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and check out. But at the same time, I read Judy Bloom cover to cover. And it was a good experience to do that to read it cover to cover and finish it and get every piece of meaning out of it because that developed the muscle memory that that could be done. Mm -hmm. That like I could finish a story and get all the pieces out of it. So it made me read her other books. So mm -hmm. I think I read all of the Judy Bloom books all the way up to Forever, um, which was her book that, you know, was about college age kids. Ooh, you know, um, but I would imagine you wouldn't like any of her work, but it was my gateway into reading um, other complete stories. Mm -hmm. I always was able to read nonfiction um, pretty well, but it was fiction that always kind of uh, um, was still as a challenge for me reading fiction. Okay, so that's a big lead up to say like Twilight, the book Twilight and the Twilight series, right? I'm sure you love that. That's part of the canon, isn't it? Um, Twilight. So um, when those books came out, Stephen King torched the author of those. He says mm -hmm. it's the worst trash he ever read. I mean, he just like, savaged her um, um, in a way that was just like uh, just terrible but Stephen King's books are very good he's a contemporary mm -hmm. writer and he could savage her because he's very good at what he does mm -hmm. would you put an author like him for instance in his books like The Shining or others up at that level of quality that if you read them you would be getting deep meanings out of things it is fairly rigorous it is great storytelling depends on the thematic arc and honestly, I haven't read any Stephen King books, so I can't really say, but I know that like, if I was teaching creative writing, we would definitely be reading a Stephen King book because there's a lot. He has so many books that you can pull from um, and you can use that as an example. So like, it's it's not like the canon is like, you're in, you're out. Like it's pretty fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fuzzy. Like who is in and who's in out, who's out. Um, it just depends like what the purpose is. Um, and again, like, because I haven't read any books cover to cover, I can't talk too much about it. Yeah. Um, just because like, I don't like talking without knowledge, which is what I feel like a lot of people do. Um, <laughs> um that might be me on Macbeth. Um, <laughs> you know, just so, to let you know, we read yeah. Macbeth and we read things fall apart in my classroom. So 
Oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, I, I have a question about Macbeth, but before I say that, I want to say Tanji has a uh, uh, quote here that I think is very important. It comes down to the difference between an understanding of a versus the. And yes. there's a difference between a canon 100%. Uh, of literature and not the canon. That's my biggest problem in yep. a nutshell. The canon does not exist. That's my point. That actually solves everything for me. Uh, Tanji, thank you so much for that because that solves my problem. If Because what I will say oftentimes to people that push the canon is that's a canon and your children are welcome to it. Yep. But in this house, I have a <laughs> canon. Yep. Um, and Black this Panthers is, have a canon. Black Elizabeth, Panthers have a canon. This is hey, the stuff that you're going to read. Like yes. everyone has like, if you're going to be a part of us, this is the stuff that we believe that we're going to pass down to you. That's yeah. what canon means for me. It's like, this is the stuff that you need to know. Um, a canon. A. It's not the at all. Now you got me. Now now I'm like, now I'm feeling it more because I feel like that is always my problem. When other people are telling me that the canon is their canon, that their canon is the canon, and it's all them. It looks all just like them. Yeah, I'm no, thinking, that's of wrong. course you would say that. Of course you would say yeah. that because you want everybody else to be normed to you. Yeah. Um, okay, Macbeth. Um, <laughs> why is Mac Macbeth good? Why is it good? <laughs> yeah, why is it good? Why is it good? I mean, one, I love the Shakespearean tragedies. Like, you know that everyone's going to die, but the way that they die <laughs> is so wild. It's just like, yeah. Yeah. who came up with this? Yeah, like that's what it's like. But then also like the way that kids interact with it, you think that they won't. But like there was so much laughter when we were studying it and like joking and like what? Like kids getting so into it um, just because the stuff that's going on is so crazy. Like that's it kind of just you get wrapped up in the like insanity of the story. Um, yeah. But then also there's just like like I I I um. At the beginning of the book, I asked them, I'm like, so if your like life partner, like I didn't say husband or wife because I just whatever. Um, I was like, so someone you're in a deep relationship with, they get into trouble. Like, do you stand by their side or do you say like deuces? Like, sorry, I'm out. <laughs> and the class was split. Yeah. And I had yeah. them think about that question because in Macbeth, like Macbeth literally kills someone. And then Lady Macbeth is like, OK, you can't finish it. I'll finish it for you. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I don't know if I would have stayed with that. And then the, so it's like, that's the fun stuff. It's not just like, this yeah. is the greatest thing that's ever been written. Like, I, I don't. I mean, I did that with Things Fall Apart. I did. I'm like, this is one of the most important books that's ever been read. Because um, yeah. it, it is. Um, I've ever been written. But I'm not like, you have to love this. I never do that. I think that's like, that's not the point. Um, yeah. But like, and also, like, the language is fun. Like, some of the soliloquies are just, like, insane. And then, like... Let me ask you about that, too. Do you read it in the original language? Like, that... Yeah. All that weird thou mm -hmm. art, you know, blah, blah. It's yeah. not, like... My kids not, like, did. The, is we there, like, a, a, you know, a new... A good news Bible version? You know how the good news Bible puts things into common English? Like, you know, regular... You can you read know? the No Fear Shakespeare, but it takes all the fun out of it. Um, just watch really? the play. Yeah. The No Fear Shakespeare is boring. Like, it's just, like... It's, like, someone that like has a, maybe they took like one writing class in college, just read Shakespeare and then just put it in regular boring prose. Like it's not fun. <laughs> if you want, you could also yeah. read the um, tales from Shakespeare. They take the plays and they put them into like literary prose. So those are fun. Yeah. If you want to get like an introduction or a feel for the plays. But I honestly recommend if you're not someone who's studied Shakespeare, like with someone, um, you're probably not going to be able to pick it up and read it. So just yeah. watch the plays. Um, Instead of... Uh, yeah, uh, the, they're really fun to watch. Um, yeah, yeah. So you have kids, uh, city kids, that are engaging with the, the language. Yeah, yep. and and it's be, it's coming alive, and it's fun for them, and they're having they're engaging with it. Yeah, yeah. That to me is actually well, it's a good thing to hear that that's actually taking place. It's not the way that I was taught. Actually, you know. Uh, the way I taught was very much like we don't care whether this engages you or not, or whether you care about it. Yeah, it was what very much like. Yeah, it was very much like this is the world's knowledge. If you don't like it, that doesn't matter. Like oh, this is just no. it. Yeah, yeah, this just is what it uh -huh. is. And this and and it was even worse than that because it was almost like the smart kids of you will read it and get it on your own, and the the dumb kids it's just maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you should be an auto mechanic. I mean, that's the way it was really taught. Yeah. No, not for yeah. me. Um, and like I talked, I told them about my 
in my story with Shakespeare, like I was at, I was doing um, a Shakespeare class. Like it was just Shakespeare. And I was really afraid because I'm just like, this is going to be hard. And like, I don't really know if I'm supposed to be here. Like all the imposter syndrome with being like at a predominantly white institution, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so in that class, we read 12 Shakespeare texts in one semester. Jeez, damn. But by the, in the beginning, I was just like, oh my God, this is so hard. I don't get it. Um, but then part of our work was to submit three questions about what we had to read for the day. And one day um, my professor said my name and like brought up my question and posed it to the class because he thought that it was a good question that mm -hmm. could elicit a lot of response. And that was when I, basically it was just that, it was just like, I can do this too. Like mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. do, like, it's not like something that's not for me. It's just like, it can be for me if I want it to be. Um, and so that's the story that I told my students. I'm like, you don't have to like it, but I hope you get something out of it. And it also allows you to know like, you can do whatever you want. Like there isn't any text that's off limits to you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like mm -hmm. it. You don't have to read it for pleasure, but should you choose to, now you have the skills to be able to go through it um, and to have some confidence with that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that, that's how I framed it. So, um, so there's a comment here somewhere that says Shakespeare requires great pedagogy. And I guess that's what we're saying right now. Like yes. the two of us, but you know, you mm -hmm. had great pedagogy. You're, de you're delivering great pedagogy, but you also had it before you became a teacher. I actually had bad pedagogy. I had. I mean, I think most classrooms do. Um, have bad, you think most classrooms have bad pedagogy? Unfortunately, yeah. Really? Really? That's a I pretty just, stunning the, assessment. The things that I have seen English teachers do make me cry. Wow. Yeah. Like, <laughs> say more. <laughs> I'm going to talk at you for yeah. 60 minutes about what you read from the book. Take notes. Um, I'm going to talk at you for 20 minutes and then give you a low level activity. Um, we're going to read the No mm. Fear Shakespeare aloud. And then you mm. have like, go look up quotes. Like there's no actual discussion of what's going on in the book. Like, mm. just like, mm -hmm. like, look at what Lady Macbeth just said. She says, if I told you that I was going to kill my kid, I would do it. So you have to kill the king. <laughs> like that was her reach. He's like, basically, yeah. if you don't, you're not a man. The kids were like, what? What yeah. does she mean? And so yeah. like that kind of stuff. I have not seen that. Um, okay. Well, let me ask you another question. Cause you know, mm -hmm. in my thing about like the movie is always better than the book um, or a derivative is oftentimes better than the original. Uh, and by that, I mean, like, uh, you, we could talk about three act structure and where it started, mm -hmm. but there's, everything is three act structure now in movies and whatnot. So wherever it started, it did become something very good now today where you watch a movie and you're not paying attention to the fact that, mm -hmm. that, that it's a three act structure. You're just paying attention to this is a great, it has an arc. You keep talking about mm -hmm. the arc, right? Um, so, um, Looking at all the allegory in the movie, The Matrix, for instance, um, or all the soup Marvel, Marvel, yeah, what's that? So you and the Matrix. The Matrix, the Matrix, <laughs> the Matrix. Like to me, the Matrix uh, trilogy has way more than anybody's canon to me in terms of number of like Christian allegory and um, and political philo philosophical across different cultures. It's all embedded in there, and and mm -hmm. they did it on purpose. Like you can read the script. And you can see where the Indian philosophy is in there, where the Christian philosophy is, where mm -hmm. the historical references, all that. Even Cornell West added some things uh, to part of the trilogy that helped them with their philosophy. Um, but even aside from that, like the superhero movies all have what could be considered a Shakespearean yeah. uh, undertone to them, right? The um, hero's journey. Yeah. So mm -hmm. wouldn't that wouldn't that g deliver the same kind of effect for people uh, if they're reading these deep and meaningful superhero stories, for instance, or, or watching, you know, these superhero meanings, the themes are the same. The themes that they're getting, the information is just div uh, delivered differently. Yeah. And so that's the other thing. Like we don't just teach themes. Um, we also teach language. We also teach structure. And what I would prefer to do is to teach like some of the foundational stuff. Like this is kind of where hero's journey came from. And this is where you might see it pop up. Um, and this is, you know, this is, this is that structure that you're seeing. Um, and I mean, that just, that's, that's a difference between like what counts as literature and what doesn't. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a teacher of literature. I'm not a teacher of like discourse studies or like whatever. 
Um, and Tangie just said, teachers don't actually read the text, understand the material on a deep level. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing some work right now. <laughs> I'm doing some work right now with some teachers that are using curriculum. And it's just like, did you guys understand the book? And wow. I don't think that they do. Um, wow. And it's just because that subject knowledge is just missing because it's difficult to have a deep understanding of a text if you don't know what to do when you, know, you haven't been taught it or how to develop your own understanding or where to go or even um, what to do when you encounter a text. Like mm -hmm. I was in a classroom, mm -hmm. in a middle school classroom, and like the kids would just listen to the audiobook for 40 minutes, and then they'd fill out some questions and put them in a box every day. Wow. Yeah, no <laughs> and, discussion of it, just yeah. listen to the book, hear some questions, put them in the box every day. So, you know, as we're talking, I'm thinking about some other books that did hit home for me when I was younger, um, and I completely forgot about some of them. So I wonder where these fit in with what you're talking about. Like The Lord of the Flies um, mm -hmm. was a book that I read. And for some reason it resonated because it was a bunch of badass kids. <laughs> I mean, maybe, <laughs> that, maybe that was it. Books like that, Animal Farm, you know, Orwell and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Is that part of what you consider to be canonical? Uh, work 100%. Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that fits in. So it's not really just this old English thing or this. No, you know, the people that okay, make so. those arguments are just, I just, they just... I don't know why they make them like, why aren't we reading the old books? Like that's how yeah, I feel like they're yeah. talking. And I'm just like, what do you mean? Like, I just, I don't understand where that idea is coming from. Like we talked about Plato in my theory of knowledge class the last year I was in high school. And this yeah, was for the yeah. IB program. Um, but like the general classroom, I don't like, you're not gonna die if you don't talk about Plato. It's useful because you can like learn about um, uh, well, the Socratic method, that's Socrates, but like stuff yeah. like that. Um, but like, like, I mean, there, yeah. there's probably like a lot of thinking around for some one group of people, it's about defending Western culture, mm -hmm. not Western culture, Western civilization. Yeah. So like they will locate much of what they believe in the love in the world in like, like in some cases, Shakespeare is the young people amongst the culture that they're trying to preserve. <laughs> they're really thinking about Rome and Athens, uh, you know, and, and Greece. Um, and, and anything you do to disturb that you are attempting to say that Western civilization is actually wrong and is not right. Um, uh, which leads me, that's why I asked you the question about like Orwell and others, which are, um, they're more contemporary, they're more, they're more I'm not going to call them, so. they're more contemporary, but like, again, canon grows and shifts and changes. Like, yeah. um, yeah. yeah, they're old at this point though. They're older at this point. Um, so is Zora Neale Hurston. Yes. Audrey Lord is even, you know, like, I mean, come yep. on, like, and Baldwin. <laughs> Baldwin, <laughs> like, 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 they're yeah, newer, yeah, but they're yeah. still old. Um, but what about, they're not um, even being taught. What about coats? You know, stuff like Between mm -hmm. the World and Me. Um, it's not necessarily literature, but it's in the James Baldwin that. tradition. You mm -hmm. feel like that could be teached in a way that is rich and meaningful. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's beautifully written. Um, he's a phenomenal writer. My only concern with that particular book is I feel like it kind of like fetishizes like black pain. Um, mm, mm, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. and so that's my only concern. It's not like, it's not well written. Like I'm not gonna, no, it's just like how to fit that in without it just being like, well, the world is going to end. If you're black, you're never going to get ahead. Sorry. Um, so that's my only worry mm -hmm. with that one. It's making sure that mm -hmm kids don't walk away feeling that way but then also like doesn't he like live in a penthouse in manhattan like <laughs> <laughs> he so, does but i will say this about him which i think is really rich and, and important is he grew up in basically a library his dad has one of the biggest libraries of black texts anywhere mm -hmm. and he grew up in that he actually like literally lived in in the texts of mm -hmm. all black authors and whatnot so i would say if he's if he's talented he should be because he grew up in in a pretty rich soil with a yep. dad that was like a collector, a book collector. Um, and he got to see all that stuff. So that's all part mm -hmm. of him now. Um, I'm being shamed, just so you know, right now by Michelle Johnson, who's like shaming me in the comments about like, I hope the eight black hands have fun with you on Sunday about loving. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> Uh, I don't care. You know, I just put it out there like Chris Stewart is not somebody who cares. I do not care. You do not uh, care. I'm just going to put it out it. there. Yeah. <laughs> but, listen, that was a good book. It was well written from end to end. I kept expecting something different to happen than happened. And it ended 
on a note, ended on a note that I did not expect it to end on, which was disappointing because I was expecting somewhere in there there was going to be something a little bit more uh, uh, provocative, but there wasn't, mm -hmm. but it was still very good. Um, so I want to jump real quick to uh, um, um, kind of what I saw you tweet yesterday. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this is getting back to our point about we're in a moment right now between woke and unwoke people fighting. One of the things that they are fighting about is what we should teach and how we should teach it. There are, you know, the, I made it a little too simple when I said that there's the disrupted text people and there's the canonical uh, people. I think we just did a good job to say, even with on the canonical side, there's a difference between the people that believe that everything is about Western civilization and those who believe that canonical texts um, are a rather than the, like it's mm -hmm. an a canon rather than the canon. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of these anti-woke um, articles I'm going to click to the article real quick here. So this is Ugh, the um, gave him a click. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. So there's this article right now to combat woke classrooms. Go to the source. University education programs. And there's a lot in here that um, kind of misrepresents with cri what critical ra race theory is. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot in here that misrepresents what people, what uh, political progressives are attempting to do yep. in education to broaden the view on it. It got passed around by a lot of people who tend to agree with us. On a lot of things i know that's what puts us in a really bad situation is yep. that we so do believe in pedagogy and pedagogical like reforms and and quality and teacher quality and all of those things but sometimes the people that agree with us on those things and give us a lot of yay boys and attaboys they say actually, junk like that yeah they're problematic and sometimes in some ways where i don't think that they know it but their cultural chauvinism actually comes out and then it's our problem because yep. we're so tagged by them. We're tagged into their work all the time. They love us in, in some ways. Um, what 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 got under your skin about this? Enough for you to actually <laughs> tweet about it and say, uh, another article that has the same lukewarm tropes and foundational misunderstanding of the stuff it aims to critique. Um, um, and then you, you, know, you even call out here people that we know and work with who, who are tagged in this, in this story. What got under your skin about this? Um, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like part of it is just like the author itself. Um, like I feel like in like the last six months, they've just they've just been misrepresenting a lot of things and just like blatantly lying. Um, like like they had a tweet that said um they were like uh like we made Black Lives Matter friendship bracelets in teacher prep, and like no, you didn't. <laughs> um, that's just a lie. And so yeah. it's just like really just kind of lying to try to get followers up. And then just like, what it is about that article is it's just like, it's just like kind of like picking like random articles to try to make a point, but it just, there's just so little understanding of the stuff that it's critiquing. It's bothering me. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it's like, you can I'd, I'd go ahead and critique like this idea that like, there's no right answer in math. But it's not just like, oh, it's just a woke thing. And I'm like, you don't even know what they're saying because you just read what James Lindsay said about it. You know what I mean? Um, so it's like, there's just, there's that person in particular. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. they don't do enough reading, um, but they're positioning themselves as an expert and people are eating it up and that's what's bothering me. Um, and it also kind of makes me consider, I'm like, if people are like agreeing with what I'm saying, but then also agreeing with that, how am I positioning my own arguments? Um, and go. so that's that's a thing for me too. It's just like, I gotta be very clear about where I stand on things. Um, the, what, the Western canon is not white dudes to me. Um, yeah. The canon does not exist to me. Um, and like you see a couple tweets back, I'm just like, yeah, abolish the police. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm still, <laughs> my joke is it's like, I'm actually kind of woke, but just not Twitter woke. Um, <laughs> you're not overwoke. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Um, like, Wokeish. Wokeish. Yeah, yeah. Woke I'm awake. Yeah. Um, yeah. And awake. So like there you go. That's what you are because you know what? That's the proper English too. So you're awake. I'm just awake. <laughs> yes. Um, I actually love that you made this point because you made it right at the moment that I was feeling the exact same thing, which is that my friends that agree with me on things like um, pedagogical improvements and um, and strong teaching, strong learning, um, 
um, are problematic in ways that I don't always feel, but right now it's becoming a moment where they are showing their tails yep. and they are putting me in a bad situation because I'm not mm-hmm. the Candace Owens of education. I'm not nope. here to be, beat up on my own. Not people. at all. Yeah. You know, I'm not here to be your whipping boy. Um, you, your whip on my own people. I'm not here to be that. I'm not here to, to just, I have lots of criticisms and critique of people on the left and, and progressives and educational pro- progressives specifically. Yep. Because they are so lost in their own kind of nonsense. They're like alphabet soup of weird ideas yes. that they, they, they're worthy of ridicule. That doesn't mean that the people on the right don't um, have their, their, their things too. Exactly. Like they'll be like, you mean we're not teaching proper English? And I'm like, um, hold on. Yeah. Like that proper thing doesn't exist. There's different rules right. for each. Like, I, I'm like, I speak African-American English. We grew up speaking that. It's not yeah. incorrect. It has a different set of rules. So when I talk to kids, I'm like, we're going to be practicing this way because of X, Y, and Z. I don't just say, you're going to stop talking the incorrect way. And that's what I feel like the anti wokes do. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Not at all. Um, Anybody, like any person who interviews people for jobs these days, um, let's just put AAVE off the table for a second, so-called Black English, African-American vernacular English. Let's just put that to the side for a second as a variant of, of the American English that oftentimes gets, um, you know, whatever, shown to be whatever it is. But if you interview people for a job, there's a white millennial language also that could be considered like AAVE. It really could. Really? This, oh, a yeah. white millenn- what's, my, what's white millennial language like? It's, 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 it is not. So what triggered me to say this is when you said proper English, right? Mm -hmm. When people, what do you mean? We're not going to teach proper English. My feedback on that is, do you think your kids speak proper English? Right. Have you ever interviewed a (laughs) hundred people for a job? Do you think they speak proper English? Do you think, do you really think that's what they're speaking? Um, They speak this weird language of, of abbreviations and uh, unfinished and unstructured sentences, lots of up talk, mm-hmm. you know, with the, the the voice going up at the end of a sentence, uh, making things sound like questions that aren't really questions, um, not speaking in a, in a way that is straightforward, confident with the normal sentence construction that you would be speaking if you spoke proper English, right? Mm-hmm. But they don't call that out. That is their variant of A-A-V-E, you know, and then there's all these like filler words and weasel words that people put into conversation. Now, I feel like, no, you don't feel like that's not what you yeah. actually mean to say. Mm-hmm. That's not, there's a difference between a feeling and a thought. And if you don't know the difference between those two things, then you're not speaking proper English, right? You know, yeah. proper English, but it never gets called out. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I just do think that people who are so firm on what culture should be. Mm-hmm. And it should be to the right, and it and they have the right one. They're problematic for us. Um, and I'm glad that you called out, you know, very specific people because there's people in our camp, in our support group, who very clearly believe they know every damn thing. Um, and and some of them don't have the receipts that they say on yeah. the teaching and the learning and the schooling. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it there. Um, but I'm glad you called this out. Did you get any heat? Did you get any pushback for, for this, for these tweets? Um, so I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so I have you the thing know? about me because I don't, I'm not, like, you can't pin me down. Like my, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm for black people. Like that's what it is. If something's good, I'm going to take it. If it's not, then whatever. I don't care who has it. Um, but I have a lot of people like on the woke left that follow me. <laughs> Mm-hmm, but I also mm-hmm. have a lot of people on like the D canon that also follow me. So people are probably just saw my comments like, wait, what? Um, and I had a couple people DM me like, I just so appreciate your thinking. Like, oh, wow. because yeah, about that. So it's like people are, people want to say something, but they're kind of afraid to. And they're like, I feel like something might be off about this. And then I call it out. Um, I just, yeah, I normally I wouldn't, but I'm just like, I am concerned that I'm getting lumped in with that. And that's not how I, that's not who I am um, yeah. or how I think about teaching and learning. Well, I love that you, um, that you were brave, that you stepped up there and said it because you're someone in, in some ways um, there needs to be more of you people who can actually have a, a foot in different areas of the debate. Like, you know, not just be one thing, not be pigeonholed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that there's, there needs to be more people who are strong on the academic part. 
strong on the teaching and the learning and the the science and the pedagogy of teaching part, but are not um, not culturally Candace Owens uh, um, um, replicas. People yes. who just say whatever the school choice side of things wants us to say or the the right side of things without ever challenging them on every, on anything. We're not always going to win a lot of friends by doing that. Um, but I can't actually, as a self-respecting black man in the United States, um, regardless of how I feel about the things we agree on, allow you to put me in the situation or put you in the situation where we have to defend the indefensible, right? Mm -hmm. We had a man die who had a police uh, knee on his neck for nine minutes in, the, in, in this city. The police department in the initial report was going to write that off as he died from other causes. And that was going to be the end of story. Mm -hmm. If there hadn't been a 17 year old girl standing there with a camera, with a, a cell phone and, and videoing that for the full time, this would be a very different story in terms yeah. of justice and how it plays out. Our friends who support us on very specific, discrete educational issues, if they can't get that we're fuller people mm -hmm. than just reading science, um, they don't get us. Yep. Um, and they have to be made to get us and to understand it. Um, I'll give you the last word. What do you want people to know about what you're seeing as like most important at this moment for our kids as an educator? Um, um, like what is, what's the heaviest thing on your mind right now just about getting our kids in education? Um, I mean, it's, I don't even know if I have a last word. It's very difficult to, I don't even know how to say this. I don't know how to make kids feel like there's hope right now. Um, and that's difficult because I kind of feel like that. Um, and so that's, that's my issue is I can't take how my own principles might, how I might feel about those things and tell those to kids because they still have their whole lives to try to do something else. Um, and to, you know, not be demoralized. Um, and so even if you don't know if there's hope or whatever, like you can't tell kids that there's no point. Um, you have to try because that's like the history of our people is that we just keep going forward no matter what it's like. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's all I can say is teach, teach the heck out of your kids um, mm -hmm. and make them feel successful and confident and um, protect them um, as much as you can in your classroom. Well, I just said, um, actually want to say, I so respect what you do and the position that you're playing. Your writing is very clear and to the point. Um, I, I love people who make things clear for us, for the public and for specifically for our people. Right. So you're doing a real kind of service in the world. You're doing double duty. You're teaching in the in, in the classroom or teaching with kids as a as a profession, but also you're writing. And you're making this more visible for a larger group of people, which is what we need. Because we don't all live in classrooms every day. We don't see mm -hmm. what goes on there. We really don't. We're parents. We're out here. Uh, right now, I'm having a very rough time with remote learning. That's my world in terms of what's going on. Um, so it's nice to have educators kind of say, like, let me frame some of the issue for you. Um, mm -hmm. So you're doing an amazing job of that. I hope you do stay in Minnesota for as long as we have this gap in outcomes. Um, because our <laughs> kids in Minnesota are hurting. Uh, I'm sure they're hurting in a lot of places, but um, mm -hmm. there are times that I just want to move up to Canada and be like done with it. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, who knows? Maybe I'd find the same thing in Canada that we have here. But if people watching this or listening, you want to find um, Jasmine, um, you can find her on Twitter at Miss Jasmine MN. That's her handle. And Miss is just MS. So MS Jasmine uh, MN, you can find her on Twitter. Her Twitter feed is actually, I think, one to watch because she is level-headed. Um, she is um, insightful and smart. And the people who engage with her Twitter feed also bring kind of like differences of opinion. So it's kind of interesting to watch. So I'd say definitely um, go and take a look at her there. What's your blog, uh, Miss Jasmine, so that people know? Um, I think it's just called jasmineteaches.wordpress. Um, I made it when I was in grad school. And I didn't actually expect it to be a real blog. That's the funny thing. Like I had to do it for an assignment. I was like, yeah, fine. But now it's a thing. <laughs> well, it's a very good blog and, and knowing that that's the, uh, the origin story. So people go find uh, um, Miss Jasmine's blog and you can also find her on Citizen Ed. So if you go to citizen.education backslash author 
backslash Jasmine Dash Lane. That's a lot. That's a mouthful, but it's in the comments. Uh, you can also find her there. Thank you again, Jasmine. Appreciate you. And uh, thank you to everybody who's listening and watching today, giving us an hour of your time every day to talk about education. is uh, It's a major, major, major win to me because the more we come around, the more we circle the wagons around good ideas around education for our kids or even the problems uh, that they're facing, the more progress.